Who here had a tough week? Anybody, anybody just hanging on? Yeah. Hey, you're in the right place, right? You're in the right place. Um, like I always do, I want to start with just a quick story uh, and share with you guys. Recently, I switched gyms. So I was going to an LA fitness over here by uh, the SoFi Stadium and had been going there for uh, man over a year since, I, since COVID opened up the gym. I started going to this gym, LA Fitness, not too far. But um, I recently switched gyms to one that's a little bit further away from my house. It's over on Hawthorne, 147th. Uh, and the reason why is they've got a basketball court. It's a bigger gym. They've got more equipment. There's less wait time on many of uh, the, the pieces of equipment that I, I really like to, to use. And so um, it was a great switch. I've had a chance to meet some new people. And, and for me, basketball is like therapy. Uh, I'm not great at it, but I just love the environment. I love the community. I love the brotherhood, the camaraderie. I like the, the beef. Like I, I enjoy the, the little fights and the, like I'm sick. I love it, man. I just love, you know, talking crap. And I love just the, what, it, what comes with it. Like it's my guilty pleasure. But for those of you who are familiar with the gym, with the gym comes gym culture. Everybody, and for all the gyms that I've been to, I've been to gyms around the world over and over. And what I found is that there are some truths, and you don't have to agree with this, but what I found is that in every gym, there's always a guy who likes to talk, right? <laughs> Anybody, oh, you guys laugh because you know what I'm talking about. There's the guy who gets nothing done. I mean, he's there three, four hours. He brings the big duffel bag and the water jug, and he just talks. You know, you're like, are, are you going to get off that equipment anytime soon? He's like, no, I'm camping on it. And with that guy, there's always the friendly kid. There's a, a kid who always like, hey, you're real big. How many sets do you do? How many, how, how many, you know, what do you do? What do you think about creatine? There's always the talkative kid who has a million questions, right? They look up to you and they're just like starstruck. They think that you're the next best thing since sliced bread. And they're constantly like interrupting you. And the thing about kids, especially this generation, is they have no like social skills. As you're in the middle of a set and they're like, hey, how many sets are you doing? Man, I want to get big like you. What is it that you do? And you're just like, bro, I'm trying to survive. Get out of the way. Let's talk afterwards. There's also the dumbbell guy the guy who has the fives and the tens and the 15s and the 20s and the 30s. And you're like, are you using those? They're like, yeah. Well, what about those? Yeah. He's like, I'm using all of them. And he's there and he's ever, and it's like, bro, you like one piece of equipment. Um, there's the guy that we all know, the half rep guy. Okay. And this isn't, listen, if this is you, maybe you are, one of you are like, dang, <laughs> that's me. Um, this isn't an indictment. This isn't judgment. This is just like, this is true. This is biblical. Okay. This, the, these people, whatever gym you go to, you're going to find these people. There's a half rep guy. The guys who's like, I can squat 315. You're like, let's see. And they're like, ah, and you're like, that was not a squat. That's, that's not a full rep. And then there's my favorite or probably least favorite. And that is the naked guy who's always in the locker room who you want to, who wants to have a full blown conversation every single time. And this is a guy thing, maybe not a girl thing, but there's that guy in every gym, YMCA, LA Fitness, 24 hour, it doesn't matter. You walk in and you're just like, oh my gosh, like a towel would be fantastic. <laughs> but don't think that girls are going to get off that easy, ladies, because for all of the things that we have with gentlemen, we have the same with women. You have the I only do cardio girl, right? <laughs> 45 minutes just on that elliptical, just getting after it. I don't want to lift weights because I don't want to get too bulky, right? They say that. I don't want to lift any weights. I don't want to, I, I don't want to get too big. There's also the gal who does leg day every day, right? Every, what are you going to do? I'm going to work on legs. Leg day, leg day. They're trying to work on uh, their posterior chain. Um, there's also the selfie girl, uh, the one who takes more pictures than actually does lifting. And um, nobody's laughing because some of you are like, dang, like that's probably me. And then there lastly is the influencer gal who's probably sponsored by Gymshark or Pretty Little Things and has a matching set every single time. And they do the, they do the pose, the pose and the selfie thing. It's a, it's a, it's a thing, okay? There's gym culture. And I promise you, this has to do with my message today. So I'm at the new gym, and uh, 
what I've noticed is that some people from the old gym come to the new gym, especially they're not too far away. So people kind of pick and choose based on location. So I've run into people from the old gym at the new gym. Well, Wednesday I was going to Dallas and I said, I need to sneak in and get a quick workout before I fly to Dallas. And so I'm on a time crunch and I zip over to my new gym. And as I'm heading in, I'm kind of in a hustle. I see the kid who asks a lot of questions, okay? I see him, and I'm hustling, and I stop real quick because I don't want to run into him because I know he's got some questions, and I pretend I'm looking at my phone, looking for the QR code to log in, and uh, I witness him. He finally goes in, and I'm like, cool. I come in, beep, scan in. I see him go left, so I naturally go right. I don't want this interaction, right? I'm, I'm on a time crunch. I don't have a lot of time. So I beeline over, I get to the squat rack, I set my bag down, I kneel down to tie my shoe, and I feel this shadow <laughs> come over. And I'm like, I look up, and he goes, hey, bud, haven't seen you in a long time. Do you mind if I work in with you? And I said, I would love nothing more than for you to share this squat rack with me. And so we did. Uh, I go to put my headphones in, my ear pods. They're red, they're dead. Okay, so the idea here is that I was going to put them in and listen to music and try to speed up the pace. I still put them in and pretended like they were on. Okay, I'm not going to lie. I've got dead AirPods in my ears and I do a set and he's like, so how many reps did you do? And I'm like, five. So he does five and I wait on and I get in and I do mine and I'm stepping out. and I'm thinking, man, I could be done with all five sets of squats here, but I'm having to work in with this kid. I'm starting to get frustrated and starting to kind of like, come on, man, I got stuff to do. I got to get out of here. And uh, we do a few more sets and he comes out and he's like, hey, do you want to switch to deadlifts? And I was like, no, I don't want to switch to deadlifts. Like I'm literally, I'm following a program. I'm following a plan. I stick to the plan and I kind of got a little snappy. I go, no, I don't just come in and do random things. I'm 39 years old. I've got a plan and I stick to the plan and it goes by percentages. And I usually warm up this way and I do things a certain way and you're kind of slowing me down. And he was like, well, I'm going to go bench press. Okay. And I said, thank God. Thank you, Jesus. Okay. Get out of here. Like you're gone. But listen, you guys laugh. I get done with my squats and immediately I'm hit with this conviction. What if he needed prayer? What if he needed somebody to talk to? What if he was looking for an encounter with God? And me, as the representation of Jesus, right? I call myself a Christian, was too busy and focused on myself and most likely could have missed an opportunity to minister to somebody. What I'm realizing is that I'm allowing my busyness and my self-proclaimed important ministry and my things to be more important. They've become more important than the actual purpose, and the purpose is people. I think that if we're being honest, many of us, we'll find ourselves in that exact same place. Maybe it's your kids, your kids super excited. You know how kids, when you're talking to kids and you're like, how was your day? Well, you know, I was uh, on the slide and this kid pushed me off and then I was walking. You're like, speed it up. Like, what, what are you trying to say? You're not saying anything. Here, grab a snack and go sit in front of the TV. How many of us with our parents, maybe our older parents, you're on the phone. Yeah, I remember back, you know, 15 years ago and you're like, mom, I gotta get back to my show and you're rushing them off of the phone. How many of us are in a job or a workplace where all we're doing is looking at the clock? I can't wait to get out of here. I've got ministry things. I gotta get to this, I gotta get to that, I gotta do this. And so we're rushing through life, rushing through relationships, whether it's our kids, whether it's our family, our friends, the places where God's positioning us to make an impact, many times we're rushing through them, missing the mission at hand. Now, I'm preaching this to myself because I felt convicted. I felt horrible. I'm sitting here thinking like, man, what if this kid needed something? What if he needed somebody, a big brother? I'm here more concerned about working out and getting to next ministry event that I'm missing the ministry that's right in front of me. What I'm realizing is that we're missing these moments because we think that God's purpose is a place or a destination. Yeah. 
But the place that you're at is right where he wants you. The place and the purpose is where you're present. His purpose isn't a place. It's not this destination for us to arrive at. But every place that you go, you guys have opportunities this morning to minister to one another. You have opportunities today to connect with people, to pray for people, to love on people. Everywhere you go, we've got to get to a place where we stop looking at other people as burdens and see them as the blessing that they are. Opportunities for us to minister and to speak into their lives. Imagine Jesus saying, no, I can't do this small miracle because I've got a big miracle to take place. Right? Imagine him saying, no, 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 I can't heal the woman with the issue of blood because I've got to get to the resurrection of my friend Lazarus. What, what if Jesus was discarding and sweeping these small moments of ministry under the rug because he was searching or he was going after the big ticket items? And that's where I think a lot of us get. We think that ministry is a destination or a place, but ministry are the people in your sphere of influence where God has placed you and he wants you to minister to them right now. What I'm realizing is that the longer that we're saved, the easier it is to lose track of the mission at hand. Like the, the, the longer that you guys are saved, right? Because listen, when you first get saved, you're excited about Jesus you want, you want everybody to encounter Jesus, right? I'm telling the neighbor, I'm telling my friends, my family, I'm telling the dog, the hamster, the fish, I'm telling everybody, right? I'm, I'm just like, I'm on fire, I'm excited. But the longer we're saved, we start to reduce a relationship with God to religion. And now we start checking off the boxes. Well, I read my Bible, I went to church, I did my, uh, my prayer devotion, I'm saved, I'm good. And then you go about your day. We do the Christian things, and we let that be our relationship. We allow doing to take place of being. You are not what you do. You are because of him. You are because of Jesus being a vessel of the Holy Spirit. How many of us know that you can do all of the things in a relationship? I'm married. I can do all of the things in a relationship. I can be faithful. I can do the chores. I can do all of the dad duties, I can go to work, I can do all of the right things, but without intimacy and intentionality, my relationship could be in ruins. Amen. And in the same way, many of us are doing things for God, but we don't even know who God is. Many times we're doing the things, we're jumping through the loops, we're doing all of the Christianese things, but we're missing the point and purpose. And again, the point and purpose are people our people. What we've turned Christianity into is a self-help program where we invite God into our lives to fix things. God, fix this. Fix my circumstances. Fix my spouse because they are an absolute mess. God, open this door. Give me this thing. Give me that thing. This is what we've reduced our relationship with the creator of all things down to. We've made it this opportunity to really lay out this wish list of do these things for me. But we never realize or we miss the point that he didn't come to fix our situation or circumstances. He came to fix us. He came to give us a new life. He came to change our existence. He wants a relationship with us. So I want to talk about, you guys, we've been here and you're like, man, where's the scripture? Let me get to it. I want to talk about getting back to our first love. Our scripture is found in Revelation chapter 2. I'm going to read 1 through 4, and we're going to put verse 4 up on the screen. So if you're not familiar with the book of Revelation, today we're not talking about end times. Okay, everybody hears Revelation, and immediately you're thinking like, oh, we're talking about prophecy and the water turning red and comets strike. No, we're going to talk about the letters to the churches. And the first letter to the church was a letter from Jesus to the church in Ephesus. And it says this, these things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. If you're like, I don't know what that means. He holds stars and that's Jesus. Okay. So this is what Jesus is saying to the church in Ephesus. Uh, <laughs> verse two says, I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. Let me break this down for you. I know that you do good things. 
You care for the poor. I know you've got really great outreach programs. I know that the worship sounds really good. You've got dope programs on Tuesday, men's and women's groups, Thursday. You've got Bible study. Listen, I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. He goes on to say, and you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. You make sure that what's being preached is the truth. You do a good job of weeding out false prophets and false teachers. You guys stand on the truth. This is Jesus to the church. He says, and you have persevered and have patience and have labored for my my name's sake and have not become weary. So this church is doing a great job of doing church things. Verse four should be on the screen. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Again, this is where a lot of us are. This church was going through the motions, doing the church things. Their relationship turned into religion. You can know all about Jesus and not know Jesus at all. And that's where we find this church is where they were hungry to do the things, but were missing the opportunities to minister to the people in their lives where they were at. I felt convicted. Here I am worried about the next thing, right? I'm worried about the book sales, the podcast. I got a flight to catch. I'm worried about the church plant. I'm worried about all of these things that the world offers and promises is going to bring you peace and purpose and joy. And I'm missing out on the person who's standing right in front of me. And I think that many of us do the same thing. We're more concerned with doing Christian things than we are about the people who are right in our sphere of influence. Does this speak to you guys? Am I talking to anybody out there? Or are you guys all super saved and holy? Okay. I love that. I love it. Before there was all of those things, right, the podcast, the books, I was a guy who was just hungry for Jesus. I used to do simple videos in a Jeep. I used to say, I'm just a guy in a Jeep who loves Jesus. And and in reflecting and preparing this sermon, I'm like, where did he go? I still love Jesus. I still do my Bible. I still do all of the things, but have gotten to a place where people are sometimes just an obstacle. I'm more concerned with doing the things. If it doesn't come with a headline or if it doesn't come with some kind of advancement in my platform, I'm more worried about the big things than the people. You guys, it's about people. It's about relationship. It's sobering to me. It makes me want to reflect and make sure that I'm not living a life that doesn't line up with the scriptures. Because here we see in the scripture a church that was doing great things. They were impactful. They were laboring. They were persevering. God, don't let that become my life. That's not the legacy that I want to leave. I did good Christian things, but I lost my first love. It's sobering to me. Is it possible, and this is just food for thought, is it possible that you're doing all of the right things for the wrong reasons? I want to remind you of that love. We're going to go to Galatians uh, chapter 2, verse 20. So turn with me there real quick. I'm really up here slow turning like, there we go. It's quiet. You guys know why? That's the conviction of the Holy Spirit. That means God's speaking to you right now. I'm not saying this from any of this from a place of judgment. Like I said, I'm preaching to myself. This is something that I've been wrestling with. And you might be in a season where you're like, no, I love people. I'm an open book. I'm not doing things for the wrong reason. I applaud you. I think that's great, but be careful that you don't allow that pride to lead you in a direction that gets you wrecked. Uh, A good way to say that is you best check yourself before you wreck yourself. (laughs) It's in the book of Romans. Okay. So Galatians chapter two, verse 20 says this, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. Listen, when you put your faith in Jesus, It is no longer your life that you're living. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. This life that I live is no longer mine. When I put my faith in Jesus, I took Andrew and I nailed him to that cross with Jesus. Christ lives in this vessel now, or at least he tries to. He does his absolute best. Because unfortunately, I keep taking over. Sorry, Jesus, I don't have time for that. Sorry, Jesus, I don't have time for them. Sorry, Jesus, I can't do that. I can't go there. He can. He's got time for it. He wants to. But many of us 
are so concerned with ourselves that we're missing out what God's trying to do in us and through us. We're missing out on the purpose of our salvation. Your life is not your own. How many of us are truly living it in that manner? Again, if we're being honest with ourselves, most of us are consumed by the next event, the next job, the next promotion, the next trip, the next thing. We live in this constant life of what's next. I got to constantly be doing. But guys, we're not human doings. We're human beings. We're called to be one with Christ. Do you guys understand what you signed up for? Turn with me to Matthew chapter 16, verses 24 and 25. I know I'm throwing a lot of scripture at you, but it all comes together. In verse 24, Jesus says to his disciples, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. What I see in my own life and in the life of many others is that we only want Jesus when it's convenient. Lord, give me a spouse. Bless this job. Open this door. Clear this path. Part this sea. Make a way here. I need a miracle. But once we get what we want, we're out of here. And heaven forbid you don't get what you want, because then what is it? God don't love me. God don't hear me. He don't care about me. He forgot about me. God's not even real. But the fact of the matter is that he could say the exact opposite. He could say, man, they don't really love me. They don't care. They don't hear me. They don't want what I want for them. My encouragement this morning, you're like, the encouragement, man, all you've done is make me feel bad for the way that I'm living my life because I care too much about stuff. Like, where's the encouragement, Pastor? Uh, I promise you there, there's encouragement. The encouragement is that God is patient. And there's moments like this where we can come together. Listen, I'm speaking to the body of Christ. The, the idea here is to stir you guys up. Yeah. Think about how quick we are to forget. Yes, that's actually a couple more moments because this is encouragement. You might be sitting there under the weight of conviction thinking, man, I got to do better. Well, guess what? You have an opportunity to do so. But you think about the, 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 the Israelites. How often did they need to be reminded? Yeah. Right? You, you think about them journeying through the wilderness God's providing manna from heaven, right? Water from rocks. He's leading them by a cloud by day and night. They're literally following a cloud wherever God goes. He, he's with them. And what do they do? They're mad because the bread ain't gluten-free. They're mad because the water ain't sparkling. You know what I mean? And they're mad because the cloud's not LED, right? No, that's, that, like, that's not good. They're upset and they're in actual relationship with God. And so they need to be reminded. They need to be stirred. They have to come back to a place where, oh, man, God saved me and pulled me out of this pit. He, I was blind. Now I see. I was lost. Now I'm found. Stir me, God. Remind me of my first love. Remind me of where you pulled me from. Remind me of what the purpose is. Remind me of the mission. What is it that you want to do in me and through me? Where do you want me to go? And so a message like this, it might feel heavy because you're like, man. I ain't living right. I'm making some decisions and choices that are completely about me. But it's moments like this where we get to come together and say, hey, that's most of us. Yeah. Most of us are in this place where we forget, where our hearts get hardened. I am a pastor. I love Jesus. I spend time in the word. And even my heart got hardened to a kid at the gym. And that's not the only time. Like upon reflection, I can look and see, man, there's so many times where I'm so concerned about me and coming up and leveling up and chasing the bag and being the next best this and that, that I'm missing the purpose that's right in front of me. And again, the purpose is people. Last scripture I'm going to throw at you. It's found also in Matthew chapter 19, verses 21 and 22. So this is a story about the rich young ruler. Um, this is a guy who was really good at doing things. 
He comes to Jesus and he's like, hey, um, what do I got to do, right? What, what is it that I've got to do? The question that he asked, what do I got to do so I can have eternal life? And Jesus is like, don't murder, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't bear false witness, honor your mother and father, and love your neighbors as yourself. And he's just like, I've done them all. I'm doing all the things. He's saying, I go to Bible study. I get to church on Sunday. I'm at the outreach. I'm doing all of the things. Jesus, what else? And he says, oh, bet. That's the King James Version. Betis. He says, if you want to be perfect, go sell what you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. When the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. All right. So right now I'm going to pass the hat around and anybody who wants to give up all their possessions. You guys go ahead and put it into the offering. Now, that's a joke. You guys laugh about that. Okay. Jeez. There's a lot of church hurt out there. I know that some of you guys have probably made some bad investments in some bad churches. That, was, uh, that joke was too soon. I, I don't need you guys to sell your possessions, okay? The point here, the point here, right? I'm flying on a private jet. I'm just, phew, thank you guys, suckers. I use the scripture. <laughs> yeah. No, it's not like that. The idea here is this is an example of somebody who's doing everything right. He's doing all of the things but he's not willing to let go of his plans for the sake of better plans. He's not willing to, listen, this is, this is crazy. Don't miss this, okay? The creator, the one who made you, who knows exactly what he made you for, is trying to do something in you and through you, and you act like you know what's better. That's crazy. And you keep doing the same thing over and over and over, expecting different results. What is that the definition of? insanity. That's crazy. And so here he's saying, look, you're doing all of the things right, but you're not being who I called you to be. Sure, surely show me who you are. Let those things go. Come back to your first love. Will you give God your goals? Will you give him your dreams? Will you give him your visions? Will you give him your desires? Will you surrender those things? Because I can tell you this, I've done just that. And God has given me tenfold tenfold greater than anything that I could have thought of, dreamed of, or imagined. And this isn't a TED talk where I'm trying to motivate you guys to invest into this next new thing. Because I'll tell you this, if I shared with you what it is that he gave me that was better than I ever had, it wouldn't be what you thought. Because it's not money. It's not opportunity. It's not influence. It's not fame. Those aren't the things that God's given me. Things that I couldn't get on my own, such as peace. Who here wants peace? Peace of mind. Who here wants comfort? Knowing that no matter what, if I step foot out that door, I don't have to worry because I know where my soul's going for eternity. So I've got a peace. I've got a courage. I've got a comfort. These are the things that I didn't even know that I needed. Because the world will tell you, listen, listen, the world tells you this. To chase the bag. You only live once. To grind blood, sweat, and tears right? To go after it, that uh, money and success is what's going to bring you happiness and peace. And I'm here to tell you that I've had all of those things. I've had money. I've had those things. I've had success. I've got the awards, the achievements, and the accolades to hang on the wall. None of those things brought the peace, the comfort, or the joy that knowing Jesus does. Again, we've gotten so busy doing ministry that we forget what the actual purpose is. And what's the purpose? The purpose is people. It's people. What is it all about? Jesus. Well, listen, we forgot about the one when Jesus didn't. Jesus left the 99 for the one. Jesus hung on the cross for the one. Jesus would go to the ends of the earth for the one. But heaven forbid we get out the car and walk across the street and take a dollar to the one because we've got somewhere to be. Heaven forbid we stop and take time out of our busy schedule to minister or to hop on a call or to send an email or to send a message to the one because we're so busy. Heaven forbid I won't let a kid work in with me on my back squats because I'm trying to get a killer leg day before I fly to Dallas when this kid might need somebody just to talk to. What is it all about? 
It's about intimacy. It's about service. It's about helping others. It's about people. Again, people are the purpose. This is what, this is what blows my mind because we'll do this. God, use me. Ah, but not right now. <laughs> now don't work <laughs> because I've got some money in the stock market. I'm waiting for this thing to kind of wrap up. I, it just doesn't really work out with my timing. God, send me anywhere. Oh, right, but not there. Definitely not Inglewood. I was thinking Nashville, Dallas. I can get two houses for the price of one in Dallas of what I'm paying for in Los Angeles. God, send me anywhere but Inglewood. I want to help people, God. I want to help people. Ooh, not them. That's not the person I want to help. That doesn't look like the people. That, that, those just aren't my people. I don't want to help them. I was hoping to help somebody who looked a little bit more like me or voted a little bit more like me or wanted the same people that I want. Right? I want to be around. I want to create this echo chamber of people that really fit my agenda. Those are the people that I feel called to. Right? He's picking. Oh, my God picking and choosing who we feel called to. We say this in ministry. Oh, I feel called to those people. Imagine Jesus saying, well, I feel called to just these people. But those people over there, mm. now we understand the context of scripture. We know that Jesus even told the disciples, for the time being, I want you to only preach to the Jews. The message comes only for the Jews. There was a season, there was a time, but we're under the New Testament. We're under the new covenant. So right now, the word is for everybody. Who are we to say, ah, I just don't feel called to that individual. Now, I'm not saying you've got to devote your entire life, your energy and effort to everybody. And I believe that we are called to certain groups of individuals. Like this ministry is going to do good in Los Angeles. Probably not as good in Texas, right? A pastor with tattoos and a backwards hat and earrings might not go as well over there. But in Los Angeles, these are the people I feel called to, but that's not going to stop me. I'm not going to let my calling prevent me from helping people who I see that are in need. Again, we're too busy doing ministry that we're missing the key ingredient, and that key ingredient's love. This is where we've got it messed up. We think that success is the goal of life. But it's not. Faithfulness is. Amen. You were not saved for success. Jesus wasn't like, you know what? I need to, I'm going to save that one because I just want them to succeed. I just want them to have everything. And don't get me wrong. I am not preaching a poverty gospel. I'm not saying that you got to walk around with sackcloth and ashes and you got to feel bad for yourself. And, you know, you've just got to walk around. Woe is me. You can't have anything nice. That's not what I'm saying. Because God does want to bless you in certain ways and in certain things. But when we make the blessing and not the blesser, the focus of our attention, we're completely out of whack. Amen. God didn't save you for success, to live your best life now. Mm -hmm. That's not a shot. But that's what so many of us are giving our lives to Jesus for, thinking that I gave my life to Jesus. Why do I still have issues? Why am I still going through it? Why is it my marriage completely healed in this moment? Why are my finances not together? Why am I still experiencing this turmoil and this stress? Why are there still all of these things going on in the world coming against me? He never promised a life of ease. He never said that you would be immune to the trials and the tribulations of life. In fact, he said, in me, there will be suffering. In me, you will experience tribulation. In me, there's going to be tough times. But he's with you and he'll carry you through. Relationship is the vehicle. I've, I can't stress this more. I'm talking about like the body of Christ. We have the body. We have all of these people here. Relationship. So many of us are scared to enter into relationship with one another. We're a family. We're a community. We're a body of believers. Relationship is the vehicle. First relationship with him. Second relationship with his people. Yeah. I want you to look around. I know that's kind of uncomfortable. Look around. Go ahead. You guys can do that. Like, look around to your left and to your right. I know how weird that feels, right? Some of you are like, I ain't even looking. Your neck's stiff. You're like, I swear to God, I'm not going to look. You're just like looking forward. It's like, loosen that bad boy. It's okay to have a good look over here and look over here. Maybe even turn and look behind you. It's not going to kill you. My question is this. Have you loved your neighbor lately? Yeah. Some of y'all can't even look at your neighbor. 
You're like, no, I can't love you. No, it's out of my comfort zone. Uh. Our job is to love God first and to love others without stopping to ask whether they're worthy of God's love or not. Now, let me say that again, because I think, I think that you guys missed this. Our job is to love God first and then to love others without stopping to see if that person that you're loving is worthy of God's love or not. Too many of us, I don't know if they're worthy of God's love. I don't know if they should be loved by God. I don't know if they should enter into a relationship. I don't know. I'm kind of off. There's something about them. That's not our job. This is where I want to land the plane. We need to get back to our first love. We need to do a better job of not being so consumed with doing ministry and start being ministry. We need to look around at our spheres of influence and realize that there are people in your life at the gas station, at the hair salon, at the gym. Yes, maybe even the guy in the locker room who is there every single time. Okay, we talked about that. My camera guy saying, don't do that. Don't do that. I'm doing it. Okay, you can edit it out later. But you know which guy I'm talking about. Even that guy, right? Grab a towel and we'll talk about Jesus. Okay. Because there's something going on there. There's some deep-seated issues where you have the need and desire to be seen. Jesus sees you, okay? That's what we'll do. I'm going to invite the band to come up as I'm landing this plane. Uh, stand with me for just a second. I am tired of just doing ministry. Right? I'm tired of hearing that people are leaving the church in droves. People aren't leaving church. They're not leaving church. No. What they're leaving is the representation of what we make church out to be. Yes. People are tired of the hypocrisy. People are tired of the inauthenticity. People are tired of people pretending to be something that they're not. Are you loving your neighbor well? Are you guys engaging with one another? Are you entering into community? We have ways for you guys to get connected with what we're doing. Are you taking advantage of those? We will have people say, I feel so alone. Nobody cares about me. And it's like, bro, look around you. There are people here who want to pray with you, who want to know you, who want to love you, who want to be a part of your life. This is a family and community. Please don't you dare tell me that nobody cares when you're sitting in a place surrounded by people. I'm tired of what the church has become. I'm tired of living and pretending to do something, but it's not even affecting me. I'm not being the change. Thank you for watching. When you tithe, donate, and contribute, you're partnering with Royal City Church and preaching the gospel around the world. So thank you. Before you go, make sure you turn on the notifications and hit that subscribe button. And do me a favor, share this with at least one person. You never know who might need an uplifting message. If nobody's told you today, let me be the first. I love you and God does too.